Star Wars Episode IV A New Hope needs no introduction, and it's filled with trivia, behind-the-scenes secrets, and facts you might have missed. Here are just a few of our favorites. Punch it! When you think of Star Wars opening in theaters, you probably picture lines stretching around the block, with audience members exiting the theater after having seen it, only to jump back in line again, and news stations interviewing fans of this new Star Wars sensation. Would it surprise you to know that George Lucas was so convinced it was going to flop, he didn't even attend the premiere. Instead, he took a trip to Hawaii with another filmmaker friend. What's his name? He directed a, a little movie about some troublesome shark, uh, St Steven Spielberg. The two got wind of Star Wars' success and began fleshing out a project to collaborate on, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, which would star Harrison Ford, who of course is Han Solo in Star Wars. Han Solo, pilot, scoundrel, lover, hero. Of course, he's such a crowd favorite, especially when portrayed by the incredibly charming Harrison Ford. We cheer Solo on as he wings it through every impossible scenario, and sometimes it wasn't just the character who was winging it but Ford as well. During the scene where Han, Luke, and Chewie take over the cell block, listen to Han's struggle when he talks to an Imperial officer over the intercom. His awkwardness is genuine because Ford purposely didn't learn his lines, hoping his delivery would sound spontaneous. Speaking of being daring, watch Luke and Princess Leia swing across a bridgeway to safety. Can you believe that those weren't stunt doubles? Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill actually performed the stunt themselves, and what's more, it was shot in just one take. We'll get to another amusing story with Fisher and Hamill in a minute, but first, let's rewind a bit. Give a listen as Luke blasts a stormtrooper who falls into the chasm. Did you catch it? The trademark Wilhelm scream from Distant Drums makes its cameo. Mark Hamill might be known for his many iconic screen and voice roles, but he's also a fanboy in his own right. So much so, Carrie Fisher couldn't help but share a story to that effect on the national public radio quiz show Wait Wait Don't Tell Me in 2009. Fisher was asked to tell a juicy story about Sir Alec Guinness, the veteran actor who played Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi. Her response was, Alec Guinness once gave Mark Hamill 20 pounds sterling to go away. Hamill apparently geeked over Guinness, asking him tons of questions about his career, to the point that it became annoying. If you ever meet one of your larger-than-life heroes, let this be a reminder just to be cool. And when it comes to larger-than-life heroes, few can top Chewbacca, Han's loyal Wookiee counterpart played by Peter Mayhew. Though Mayhew's voice was later replaced with the iconic Wookiee barks and roars, a little digging will uncover raw footage with Peter's voice and lines intact. For example, after Obi-Wan leaves to shut down the tractor beam, Chewbacca barks and Han replies, Boy, you said it, Chewie. Behind the scenes footage reveals Chewbacca actually says, That old man is mad. You said it, Chewie. So how exactly did the sound of Chewbacca come to be? According to sound designer Ben Burt, the sounds were created from a compilation of large mammals, crediting one zoo-kept grizzly as a primary source. To his credit, Peter Mayhew learned to do the Wookiee roar, but it was later replaced with real animal sounds in post-production to give it more authenticity. Ben Burt's sound effects for the Star Wars universe are iconic, and come from a wide variety of elements. R2-D2 sounds are made from various people, including Burt making baby sounds. He also took recordings of real-life babies and electronically manipulated them. The ominous whir of the gigantic Star Destroyer? That's doctored audio of a broken air conditioner. Even more familiar is the flight sound of the Imperial TIE Fighters. According to the exhibit at the Smithsonian, the sound was created by combining the squeal of a young elephant with a car driving on a rain-slicked highway. Of course, there's one more sound effect you're probably very curious to learn about. And now we come to the lightsaber. Who hasn't swung a broomstick or a bat and tried to vocally recreate that undeniable sound? So how was it made? It's a combination of the hum of an idling 35mm movie projector and the feedback generated by passing a stripped microphone cable by a CRT television. Those are the ingredients anyway. How Ben Burt manipulated them is what makes him a true master. How about a cool fact regarding another true master? Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi is played by the classically trained Sir Alec Guinness. Han Solo may have been skeptical of the eccentric old fossil in the story, but according to Harrison Ford, when Sir Alec Guinness was on set, his presence changed both Ford and Mark Hamill's behavior. Ford and Hamill would normally fool around on set, but when they had to shoot with the screen legends whose epic film credits include Dr. Zhivago, The Bridge on the River Kwai, and Lawrence of Arabia, they behaved much more professionally. Now, are you ready to take a journey to the dark side? 
Darth Vader, he's possibly the most iconic villain in movie history. The shiny black helmet, the red lightsaber, and of course the unforgettable voice portrayed by James Earl Jones. The actual physical presence of Vader, however, was played by David Prowse, but he was almost played by someone else. That someone was… Chewbacca! Or Peter Mayhew, to be more precise. It's right, the Dark Lord of the Sith himself was almost played by the original Wookiee. Both Mayhew and Prowse were allowed to choose which giant character they wanted to play. Mayhew wanted to play a good guy and Prowse wanted to play a bad guy, so everything worked out perfectly in the end. Like it always does in the movie business, right? Not according to this next detail. Famous comedian W.C. Fields once said, Never work with children or animals. It seems director George Lucas didn't heed his advice. He, of course, later wrote Episode 1, an entire movie centered around a child. And in the case of this movie, take a look at the bantha being mounted by Tusken Raiders. It's actually an Asian elephant dressed in a costume of fur and fake horns. The elephant wasn't accustomed to the desert heat though, and filming it was a pain because the elephant kept trying to take the costume off. And while we're on the subject of costumes, C-3PO, the neurotic gold protocol droid, is played by Anthony Daniels. Unlike Chewbacca and Darth Vader, Daniels provided both the body and the voice for the character. This was not always going to be the case, though. Originally, Lucas was going for a character more in line with a used car salesman. Strangely, it was at the suggestion of an actor considered as Daniels' replacement that Lucas reconsidered. Daniels won Lucas over with his read as a snooty British butler, and the rest is history. Did you know that on a casting list that included everyone from Kurt Russell and Christopher Walken to Chevy Chase and Al Pacino, Harrison Ford wasn't even being considered? He wasn't allowed to audition because he had starred in Lucas's prior film, American Graffiti, and George wanted to use new faces. Still, Ford helped with the audition process, reading Solo's lines with actors and actresses auditioning for other roles, and over time Lucas realized Ford was the best actor for the part. Every cowboy needs a faithful steed, and this space cowboy has one of the most celebrated and recognized spaceships in the universe, the Millennium Falcon. As adored as it is by fans within the Star Wars universe, the ship is more infamous than famous. At first sight, even Luke calls it a piece of junk. Funny enough, he wasn't far off. Did you know that the Millennium Falcon really is made up of junk parts? According to the Blu-ray commentary, it was cobbled together with pieces from cars and airplanes from dumping grounds. Of course, the physical model is only half of the whole. There's no denying the sound of the Falcon as it screams across the screen. What makes those engines sound so interesting is that some of them were recorded at an actual air show. The Experimental Aircraft Association's annual convention in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. To show their gratitude, Lucasfilm donated a model of the Falcon to the EAA Air Museum, and that's not all. It just so happens that Han Solo himself, Harrison Ford, served as the chairman of the Young Eagles program at that very same museum. The program is dedicated to giving kids from age 8 to 17 their first free ride in an airplane. Ok, so it's no Millennium Falcon, lightsaber, or even light blaster for that matter. But these next two words are also synonymous with Star Wars. Blue. Milk. Even Walt Disney Resorts offer a tasty version of the blue concoction in the Star Wars Land cantinas. But apparently the original recipe used in the movie was anything but appetizing. Mark Hamill described the milk like this, they put blue food coloring in it and it was really ghastly. Oily and sweet and ugh, triggered your gag reflex. But I said, look, if they gave me blue milk, you bet I'm gonna drink it on camera because what other chance am I going to get? So there's an indication that I'm an underrated actor. I gulped it and act like I liked it without vomiting. Wow, way to stay on target, Luke. That's much better than the one I had in the movie. At the end of the film, our heroes are celebrated by the Rebel Alliance and awarded medals by Princess Leia. But wait, no medal for Chewie! Over the years, a growing number of fans took offense to this and they weren't alone. Twenty years later, MTV fixed the oversight when they gave Chewbacca a Lifetime Achievement Award presented by none other than Carrie Fisher. But this isn't the first attempt to correct the issue. Though George Lucas waffled on the reason for Chewbacca's missing medal, Marvel Comics also acknowledged the glaring omission way back in a 1980 comic called The Day After the Death Star. Chewie receives his medal on the very next day from Princess Leia, who can be seen standing on a table in order to reach over his head. Still, George Lucas doesn't need to lean on comic book company or TV stations to correct his sci-fi masterpiece. We're about to get into controversial territory. The face-off between Han Solo and Greedo in the cantina. In 1997, when George Lucas re-released Star Wars in theaters, he labeled it as the special edition and added extra elements to the movie with special CG effects of the time. Though many of the additions were embraced, one adjustment angered die-hard fans to no end. In the original cut of the film, Han Solo shoots Greedo from under the table before Greedo has time to react. 
In the special edition, a clumsy FX shot has Greedo shooting first and missing Han before Solo retaliates. This created a lot of resentment toward George Lucas, but is it possible he might not be entirely to blame? Rumor has it when Lucas resubmitted the movie to the Motion Picture Association of America, they insisted he put Greedo's shot in for the movie to keep its PG rating. Whether this is true or not might be beside the fact, as Lucas has given story-based reasons for the change on various occasions. In an effort to calm fans, future home releases of the scene were polished, but it still remains doctored from the original with no plans for a restoration of the original cut in sight. Fans on the internet have gone so far as to create their own despecialized cuts of the movie, doing everything they can to restore the film to its original form, with the highest quality home video picture and sound. Here's another infamous moment from the original film, but one that has grown humorously endearing over the years. When stormtroopers finally get into the room where C-3PO and R2-D2 are hiding, one of the actors accidentally knocks his noggin on the overhead door. Though the stormtrooper helmet was originally to blame as it was notoriously hard to see through, a bellyache might have been the actual cause. British actor Laurie Good, who claims to be the one inside the suit, said he was distracted that day by his upset stomach. They got the shot in four takes, and the last one, which included the bump, made it into the movie. Funny enough, of all the corrections Lucasfilm made in the 1997 special edition, they actually embraced this moment, even adding a sound effect to accompany the bump. Not only that, Lucasfilm made sure to pay tribute to it in an Easter egg moment with the character Jango Fett in Star Wars Episode II Attack of the Clones. Still, nothing lands quite like the original. I hope you liked the video and found some things you didn't know about Star Wars Episode IV A New Hope, which became Episode IV during the 1981 theatrical re-release, by the way. Just a little bonus fact. Make sure you subscribe to Movie Logic for more daily movie facts, trivia, and Easter eggs.